Nobody loves film like Quentin Tarantino. Correction, nobody loves stories like Quentin Tarantino. He's a self-proclaimed filmmaker who only writes things with the sole intent of filming it. He specifically says he's not a writer. He says if he was a writer, he would do books and not films, because there's so much more freedom. All you need is a pen and paper. Despite this claim, he seems to not know what the word limitation means. In fact, limitations may be his strength when it comes to creating. If it weren't for a small budget, we may have not gotten the dialogue-heavy Reservoir Dogs, which is what makes it memorable, to be honest. By the time he started working on Pulp Fiction, he had already written two feature films and directed one. He had more breathing room this time with a larger budget and more connections. However, he had to make this film a hit, financially and critically, if he wanted a consistent career in directing. With all the pressure in the world, he looked to an inspiration that nobody would likely look to for modern film. And that is what the film is partly named after, Pulp Fiction Magazines. The term pulp derives from the cheap wood pulp paper on which the magazines were printed, and these were known for graphic violence and punchy dialogue. He wanted to revive an old form of storytelling that was often thought of as cheap and had no substance, a limitation that he set for himself. He was modeling the film after one pulp magazine in particular called Black Mask. Black Mask was even the working title for Pulp Fiction. This magazine was launched in April of 1920 to accompany Smart Set, a magazine about solving crime. BlackMagazine.com says about Black Mask, it was a purely commercial venture, in direct contrast to Smart Set, and its first issue was not even devoted exclusively to crime. In an open attempt to cater to as wide a readership as possible, Black Mask initially offered five magazines in one, the best stories available of adventure, the best mystery and detective stories, the best romances, the best love stories, and the best stories of occult. The few pages devoted to detective stories offered little that was special, it was all standard English-influenced mystery. So even the pulp magazine he was emulating was a lower class of pulp magazine than the contemporaries. As you can see, Black Mask also had five magazines in one, which is where Tarantino and Roger Avery may have gotten the idea to make the film essentially be three interconnected yet different stories that were about crime, but not really focused on the crime aspect. While I do not think Pulp Fiction was written with the intent of catering to as wide a viewership as possible, I think it was written with the intent of being a love letter to movies themselves, and that within itself was to cater to anyone who loved movies, meaning nearly any cinema fan could watch this and get something out of it. All you have to do is look to see that the entire film is references upon homages upon shots taken from many different films. Some most popular examples include the shot of Marcellus Wallace walking in front of the car that looks similar to a shot in Psycho, Vincent dancing similar to the original Batman from the Batman movie in the 1960s, Jules talking to and eating before killing Brett was reminiscent of the good, the bad, and the ugly. The brutal violence and rape depicted was reminiscent of A Clockwork Orange. There's a shot that is very similar to shots from Taxi Driver when Butch is outside Esmeralda's taxi. The focus upon the briefcase also is an homage to Once Upon a Time in America. There are both Raging Bull and Rocky references when it comes to Butch's boxing portion of the film, but Tarantino said himself the biggest inspiration out of anything for Pulp Fiction are the French New Wave and how they did their version of American crime films and a modern day spaghetti western as well as black exploitation films from the 70s. I'll include a full list from the Pulp Fiction movie references guide because just listening to them would take too long as there are too many for the average viewer and even the most hardcore cinema fans to see. Now this could be seen as copying or a nostalgia bait, but Tarantino said himself, I have no problem being momentarily confused if you're in good hands, and I feel like this rule also applies to references. In lesser hands, the references would be more obvious and the story would rely on nostalgia, but this is more of a cherry on top of great storytelling, like an easter egg, that just makes the experience more fulfilling. The irony of this, however, is that as Pulp Fiction rose to cold popularity, it began being referenced and imitated heavily. Even if a film is not one of the countless ripoffs, if its story's structure is non-linear, it likely took some influence from Pulp Fiction. 
Some examples of just references that I saw recently were Game Night, Life Itself, and The Office. And films that were directly inspired by the entirety of Pulp Fiction were Get Shorty, Sin City, Memento, The Boondock Saints, The Usual Suspects, and Seven Psychopaths. There are many more, I'm trying to keep it brief, as well as that were either influenced by the non-linear storyline, dialogue, heavy writing, black comedy, the style, or just about any iconic line or aspect of the film. Referential cinema is becoming reference itself, coming full circle. The directors and writers of past generations are being influential on modern cinema without many people noticing. Likely the creators influenced by Pulp Fiction will go on to influence the future generations of creators. This goes along with the idea that no art is really original, just another story retold. And this is basically what Tarantino based his whole career on. He takes tired old stories and makes it his. Tarantino has also said, Writing needs real life experiences. You can't deny anything as an actor, and the same goes for a writer. All real life experiences have to work its way into it. And he also said, You should be semi embarrassed about certain people seeing your movie because it should be so personal. These stories would be nothing without his personal flair. The substance is made by the style. It was a shock how popular Pulp Fiction became because of the intense violence and in language. An explanation for this may be described in this quote. The violent intensity of Pulp Fiction calls to mind other violent watershed films that were considered classics in their time and still are. Hitchcock's Psycho, Arthur Penn's Bonnie and Clyde, and Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange. Each film shook up a tired, bloated movie industry and used a world of lively lowlifes to reflect how dull other movies had become. And that, I predict, will become the ultimate honor of Pulp Fiction. Like all great films, it criticizes other movies. Tarantino won the prestigious Palme d'Or of Cannes Film Festival, becoming only the 15th American to win, joining the likes of Francis Ford Coppola, the Coen brothers, David Lynch, Orson Welles, as well as non-American directors like Federico Fellini and David Lean. The picture was also nominated for seven Oscars for Best Actor, Best Director, Best Editing, Best Picture, Best Supporting Actor, Best Supporting Actress, and Best Original Screenplay, only winning one for the screenplay being completely snubbed for Best Picture by Forrest Gump, which was arguably the third best film nominated that year, but that's beside the point. And it was also snubbed for every other category it was in. It was surprising it was nominated for so many, but not surprising that it only won one, because the Academy usually picks the safest choices that are easier to digest, where Forrest Gump can be understood and liked by more general audiences than PF at the time. In 2013, PF was inducted into the National Film Registry by the Library of Congress for being culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. The criteria is that the film must be 10 years old and nominated by a member of the public to be voted on by the National Film Preservation Board. It joined the likes of some of the best films of all time. Being given this honor is mostly a testament to how relevant a picture can remain a decade after its release and beyond that. PF made 213.9 million in the box office, having only an 8 to 8.5 million dollar budget. Tarantino says it is very important to him that his movies make money, so that the people that believed in him can be compensated. PF also was critically acclaimed for being postmodern, Roger Ebert himself saying, Like Citizen Kane, Pulp Fiction is constructed in such a non-linear way that you could see it a dozen times and not be able to remember what comes next. It is considered timeless and fresh changing cinema forever by many, including myself. And now that I've described all this, the creators of Black Mask realize the writers alone seem to have first realized the full potential of a hard-boiled detection fiction beyond its gunslinging appeal. And boy does this ring true for PF. The title itself says it's going to be nothing but mindless violence and entertainment for entertainment's sake. The other meaning of pulp also describes what we are about to see as we view the opening as a shapeless mass, giving us probably the best double meaning in cinema history, but again, that's beside the point. Tarantino said, if you know what you're going to see in the first 20 minutes, that isn't a story. 
The original plot structure of a film has us to expect exactly what we're going to be feeling by the climax of the film. Pulp Fiction, on the other hand, has three climaxes that all come from random, reverse ex machina that happen by chance, that we as viewers couldn't have predicted based off our knowledge of contemporary cinema. We may have guessed what would happen, but not how it would happen. These characters grow and become interesting, and these mere short stories than if it were Oscar bait, conventional stories where we expected to feel what we felt. The fact that we go into this film for dumb fun makes the strike even more effective. The shapeless pulp of a plot throws us for a loop, confusing us, subverting expectations, and delivering a truly interesting story. Pulp Fiction, like Black Mask, realizes its full potential of a hard-boiled crime fiction beyond its gunslinging appeal. Imagine opening up an issue of Black Mask to find a biblical redemption story, or a story of pride and doing the right thing even when it's not needed, or even resisting temptation. This is Pulp Fiction, content where it is least expected. An example of this duality is the fact that he chose John Travolta, because he was not only a great actor, but because he was one of the biggest movie stars of the time. This can also be said about the rest of the cast. You expect to see this cast in a big Hollywood blockbuster, but we are treated with getting to see their acting chops and each of them stealing the show in their own sense. Let's not forget about Mia Wallace's character as a whole. Since when is a mob boss's wife supposed to voice opinions? Since when is she supposed to form relationships with anyone besides her husband? She's supposed to stay at home and use all of her husband's money on leisure items, as mob movies have shown us. Mia has ideals. She is a genuinely interesting person. She has something to say, whether it's about the true meaning of comfortable silences or the fact that she's just an overall independent person, having her own career in television. Now I want to talk about the movie's subtext and philosophy, or the content hidden beneath the shiny exterior. Jules in the climax, the final climax that is, proclaims, I've been saying that for years, and if you ever heard it, it made your ass. I never really questioned what it meant. I thought it was just a cold-blooded thing to say to him before you popped a cap in his ass. But I saw some this morning. It made me think twice. Now I'm thinking. It could mean you're the evil man, and I'm the righteous man. And Mr. 45 here, he's the shepherd protecting my righteous in the valley of darkness. Or it could mean you're the righteous, and I'm the shepherd. And it's the world that's evil and selfish. I like that. But that ain't the truth. The truth is you're the weak, and I'm the tyranny of evil men. But I'm trying. I'm trying real hard to be a shepherd. After quoting Ezekiel 25:17 a second time, but this time a changed man. His words sounded cool to say before, but now the words meant something completely different. They meant what he wanted them to mean. Now he sees he may have been wrong. As the text may be interpreted as the fact that he is the wicked man, and he wants to be the shepherd. He pays Ringo to leave so he doesn't have to kill him, and he can fall in line with this new definition of the righteous man. The philosophy also seems to be aimed at nihilism, of pulp fiction as a whole, or the belief that there is no meaning to life. Just as many of the characters seem not to value anyone else's life, and find meaning in small, mundane things, until something believed to be from a higher power affects one of the characters and he changes his ways, and actually starts believing in something larger than himself. The meaning is made up of many characters to justify their actions. The briefcase is only valuable because Vincent and Jules want Marcellus to have it back. They value what their boss values, and they want him to think highly of them. Murder is justified because they value what their boss says over other human beings' lives. Butch values his watch because he placed so much meaning in it. It's a piece of his father, and though it's just a mere watch, he risks his life to get it because he values the memory of his father and who he was so highly. Philosophynow.org brings up a great point about the value of names, or what something is called. In addition to the pop iconography in the film, the discourse on language here concerns naming things. What is a Big Mac called? What is a Quarter Pounder called? What is a Whopper called? Vincent doesn't know, he didn't go to Burger King. When Ringo, Tom Roth, calls the waitress Garcion, he informs him, Garcion means boy. Also, when Butch's girlfriend refers to means of transportation as a motorcycle, he insists on correcting her. It's not a motorcycle, it's a chopper. And yet, here's the crux. When a lovely Hispanic cab driver asks Butch what his name means, he replies, This is America, honey. Our, ma our names don't mean shit. The point is clear, and the absence of any lasting transcendent 
objective framework of value and meaning. Our language no longer points to anything beyond itself. To call something good or evil renders it so, given that there is no higher authority or criteria by which one might judge actions. Jules quotes the Bible for his executions, but he may as well be quoting the Fonz or Buddy Holly. Therefore, the true meaning of any character in Pulp Fiction is to obtain what they value by any means, so it can be argued that Vincent isn't saving Mia when she overdoses, or resisting sleeping with her because it is the right thing to do, but because his boss values her and he values what his boss values. Vincent obviously doesn't value human life, or he would care about shooting Marvin in the face and killing him by accident, but instead he cares about the car because it is more valuable to him to not piss off Jimmy than anything else at the moment. Butch, the other character who goes through a change, is, and is somewhat redeemed, also has no regard for human life. He just shrugs off that he killed his opponent in the ring, and he doesn't care at all about killing Vincent. He then attempts to kill Marcellus. He sees the only way to survive the situation is not to care the damage he causes like Marcellus and basically have a survival of the- Marcellus and Butch, both the deciders of what is right and wrong, are then thrown into the same terrible situation. They are bound up and about to be raped. Now the two hillbillies who have them under their thumb decide what is right and wrong, and because there is no set values for everyone, Marcellus and Butch's ideals do not matter at all here. Only the people holding the gun at the other person can choose what is right at the moment. No other ideal matters. When Butch initially escapes, he has a choice. He can stick with his ideal and escape his situation by being ruthless and letting Marcellus suffer, or he can save him, which is what he ultimately chooses. And for the first time, his violence is justified by being of value to someone other than himself, and in turn, he is let go from his initial problem with Marcellus. His choice to save another man is his turning point, just like the passage Jules constantly recites is his. They are the only two that find value in something other than themselves, and they are rewarded, whereas Vincent fails to leave the Mafia like Jules and ends up dead, only serving what he finds valuable, his honor from his boss. The fact that Tarantino took on this heavy of a load to include in one feature, with this depth of writing, with this philosophy, with this ambition, and breaking of conventions, the fact that it didn't collapse under the weight of it all is a spectacle in and it of itself. This is why, in my opinion, it is the greatest film ever made. I've never seen anything else intertwine and walk the line of entertainment and drama, art film and blockbuster, wholesome and despicable, with the most amount of interesting characters thrown in the mix. It is a passion project and a love letter to film itself. We get the best of both worlds, sheer entertainment and substance. You could not name another person that would have come up with a script. Not that they couldn't, because they wouldn't. It is entirely personal. It is film's biggest fan satisfying every need that a film could possibly deliver in its runtime.